Hello, everyone, and welcome to uh, the 430 event of this year's and the first ever um, Event World Digital Summit. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, you've joined a very special presentation by the wonderful Rafaela Marchese. Um, she's just uh, tutored me on how to pronounce her name correctly. Thank you. Um, I'm really looking forward to this presentation. I've read through the slides myself. Uh, and Rafael is going to be uh, talking about the art of communication. Um, I'll give you a little bit of background about Rafaela before I hand her over. Um, she became an interpreter because she loved the idea that she could help people through um, communicate, break down boundaries and smooth rough edges. Her first for knowledge makes her curious about any subject uh, and studying a new assignment becomes fun as a result of this. This session will highlight the, the role that languages play in our life and in our personality. It will introduce the topic of language, anxiety and language isolation, highlight the results of the EF 2019 report on English language skills. Rafaela, Rafaela will talk about the effects of selecting conference speakers based on their language skills and the effects of having English only meetings on attendees and attendee engagement. Concluding with suggestions on how the mice industry can solve the problem. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Rafaela. She's going to take us through a lovely presentation. Um, if you're having any audio or visual, diff visual difficulties, please put that in the chat uh, and I'll try and solve that for you as quickly as possible. But without further ado, here's Rafaela. Take it away. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mark, very for your well. kind uh, presentation. And I'll stop screen if I manage to do that. Um, okay. Um, well, let me try again. I knew this was going to be a problem for me, but <laughs> let's try. Whoops. Okay. Can you see my presentation now? Can you see my first slide, Mark? I hope you do. So um, I wanted to start with uh, this beautiful uh, flowers, the sunflowers, colorful and, um, and um, you know, bright, uh, because I wanted to start on a positive note, since now I'm going to take you to a very different place. It's um, the a cell at the Guantanamo detention camp because um, and I, I've taken you here because I want to tell you a story I came across a few years ago by reading The New Yorker. And it's the story of Sunat is a 16 year old uh, Uzbek who was caught in Afghanistan in 2001 during the war. And he was taken to Guantanamo detention camp where he spent eight years. And those eight years were years of total isolation. They started as linguistic isolation. And the reason was that Sunat was in a cell with people who could only speak Arabic or English. And Sunat spoke neither of them. Sunat was also denied access to any way of learning either of those languages because of a specific policy that was there preventing people from developing linguistic skills in order to communicate with other people. So Sunat was really alone, was totally isolated. And Professor Honisberg from the University of San Francisco talked about Sunat saying that he was alone in a sea of voices, because indeed there were many voices around him, but he could hear, he could make no sense of those voices. Professor Honisbeck um, also describes some of the effect on Sunat of this uh, linguistic deprivation. Um, he talks about impaired impulse control, inability to concentrate or to think clearly, confusion, obsessive behaviors, paranoia, even catatonia. So it was a very daring state for uh, Sunat. Um, creating, as I said, creating a condition of linguistic deprivation can be a specific strategy in detention camps because, you know, having no way of communicating makes you more vulnerable, less likely to organize resistance, more dependent on the prison's staff. Um, Honisberg concludes a uh, paper by saying that isolation by language barrier should be recognized, recognized as a distinct human right abuse. 
because and, and and the reason why I wanted to share this story with you is because I think tells a lot about to how important languages are for us, for our identity and for our existence. The language we or the languages we learn when we are uh, children are so important for us. They define us. They really shape our view of the world. They become our second nature. And our mother tongue stays with us wherever life takes us, wherever, you know, the turning and winding roads of our life take us. And I wanted to uh, mention this quote by this poet, Czeslaw Miłosz. Uh, he is a Polish uh, poet um, who won the Literature Nobel Prize in uh, 1980. He said, language is the only homeland. And he knew what he was talking about. And indeed, he was born in the Russian Empire, went to Poland, where he studied Polish. And then he went to the United States and went back and went to, to France as a political refugee and went back to Washington or Berkeley, actually, where he spent the rest of his life teaching poetry and writing, po writing poetry. So actually for him, uh, his language was the only identity, the only thing. It was his, in, you know, undeniable home. Um, it, it was it, his inalienable home uh, for throughout his life. Um, if you have an inkling or a passion for um, for languages, I suggest you grab a copy of this book by Guy Deutscher. Uh, it's Why the World Looks Different in Another Language. Because actually, languages are so important. It really shaped our way of looking at the world, our way of even our way of thinking. Uh, so I suggest you read this book if you haven't uh, done it yet. And linguistic diversity is even a democratic right. It's a, one of the fundamental value of the um, EU institutions. And in fact, it's a democratic right that has been enshrined in many articles of uh, the European institutions. And this bears testimony to the importance that uh, the European institutions give to uh, linguistic diversity and linguistic identity. And this is also the reason why most documents um, are translated in almost all of the 24 official languages of the EU and most of the meetings are translated simultaneously in most of those languages. Well, let me introduce myself. Of course, I have a great interest in languages myself. I am a professional conference interpreter, that's my background. And I am a proud member of IIC, which is the uh, International Association of Conference Interpreters. And I'm also the coordinator of the IIC PRIMS Standing Committee, which is the, the committee dealing with private market. And I'm Italian mother tongue, and I've studied English, French, and Spanish um, uh, um, a lot. <laughs> um, well, today uh, I will be talking, as Mark said in the presentation, about linguistic isolation, what it is, and what we in the mice industry can do to fight uh, to fight it. And I'll be addressing this topic from two different perspectives, the perspective of uh, conference speakers and the perspective of conference attendees. To do so, I'd like to take you back to a journey. And um, I want to take you back to when you yourself started studying uh, foreign languages. Maybe it was for you know, academic reasons, because of your school uh, curriculum, or it was for professional reasons. You would go to class, so you attend um, all your courses, and then you would go back home and do your homework, you know, revising your vocabulary lists, so studying your verbs. And it was very exciting indeed, I'm sure, because you know, learning a new language is an exciting experience. It, it almost gives you the keys to new uncharted territories. So I know how exciting it can be. And then you would go back to class and the teachers would ask you to Talk about how you had spent your weekend. Well, this is an easy, exciting task for some people. It can be a daunting task for other people who do not feel comfortable about speaking a foreign language in front of others, of, of other people. But let's say you learn your language and you finally manage to travel to the country where that language is spoken and you end up invited uh, at a dinner at France. Everybody else is from that country. Everybody stops 
talking that language, you know, the conversation gets heated, they start talking about the latest movie by, you know, a, the most famous uh, local director, and you have yourself a very opinionated uh, view, you have, you want to convey your message, you want to put uh, forth your ideas, but simply you can't find the words. You know, you can't, you have so much to say, but you can't find a way of putting those ideas into words, you feel that you will sound childish, that you won't be able to really take um, that in, in, inner universe you have on the table. And so you decide to sit back, keep drinking your wine and just not pretending you are involved in the conversation. As a matter of fact, you're not at all involved in the conversation. You feel isolated, you feel frustrated, you feel powerless, you, you, you feel small. Well, Psychologists have a word, a word for this. They talk about xenoglossophobia. It comes from the Greek. Xeno means foreigner. Glosso means speaking. And phobia is fear. So it's the feeling of worry, nervousness, apprehension using a foreign language. And it's um, strictly related to another phobia, which is glossophobia, the simpler version, i.e. the phobia, the fear of speaking in front of an audience in any language. And mm, it might be interesting for you to know that glossophobia is one of the most commonly reported social fear. It has to do with the anxiety of being judged by other people, and it has to do with the fight or flight response mechanism. You know, it's this uh, rush in uh, adrenaline that you have because you're faced with a threat, a, a, you know, a dangerous obstacle, and you need this adrenaline, adrenaline rush. But actually, if there is no, adre no obstacle, no threat, then you somehow lose control of your body. The, the body takes over. And the typical symptoms are you know, sweating, blushing, pounding heart, quivering voice, upset stomach, you know, all the things I had five minutes ago before I turned my microphone on. on. So the question is, why? Why do we, uh, I mean, this, this xenoglossophobia uh, uh, is probably what we expose most of our speakers to when we decide to impose a given language to all speakers. Usually this uh, given language is either the language spoken in the country where the conference is held, or it is English, or I should say Globish, which is the simplified uh, version of your beautiful language that foreigners like myself um, use in international um, situations. Um, so, you know, um, as mother tongue yourselves, as English mother tongue yourselves, uh, you know that you're usually very lenient and also very forgiving towards foreigners who attempt to speak your beautiful language. Well, this doesn't mean that the speaker will feel confident enough, will feel at ease, will neither does it mean that the speaker will be really able to convey all the um, the, 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 you know, the messages they, they want to convey, because as a matter of fact, when you're not speaking your mother tongue, you end up by saying only the, the things that you can say, not the things that you want to say. So the question is, as you can see on this slide, why do we use Globish in international events? Well, the answer is very easy, because it is easier, it is convenient, and it's definitely cheaper. But, um, uh, you know, uh, is it really true? And um, the problem is that this is based on one assumption, and the assumption is that everyone is comfortable. But I doubt that is really the case. And I also think that, uh, mm, uh, sorry, I think I'm losing. Okay, never mind. I lost one of my slides. So, uh, not everyone is really comfortable when using uh, English as a second uh, as a second language. And to um, 
argue for what I've just said, I'd like to share with you the findings of this um, report, which is published every year by the EF, which is the Education First. It's an international education institution based in Switzerland. Every year for the last eight years, they have been publishing this um, report, which is called English, English Proficiency Index. And I want to share with you uh, a couple of findings from this year um, edition. You know, the first finding is that uh, um, the 26 to 30 years old bracket is the mm, a bracket of speakers with the strongest English skills, you know, much stronger than older colleagues. And of course, this is obvious because many policies have been introduced in uh, schools, in education, um, uh, everywhere in, in the world. So it makes sense that younger people are slowly learning to be more fluent in English. But of course, our speakers at our conferences are usually much older than, than this. The second finding is, of course, that uh, managers are better in terms of linguistic skills than the executive functions in, in the, in, in, within companies. And again, th let's think about who are the person, the recipients of the messages usually shared in our conferences. The executive positions are usually those who have to implement the message, the directives, the ideas that are conveyed and um, given during conferences. And the third final uh, finding is that there are still great geographical imbalances. You know, Europe is catching up, although there are countries including Italy, Spain and France who are still lagging behind, Latin America and Asia have still a long way ahead of them in terms of English proficiency. So we have seen, uh, it, takes, it takes a long time to master a language. The EF says that it takes at least a one, a 1,200 uh, hours to get by and be able to hold a conversation, but 1,200 hours of high quality um, teaching and a high quality uh, practice. Of course, it takes much longer to be able to uh, give a presentation in a foreign language. But when you do give a presentation in a foreign language, it's very often a quite a daunting uh, experience. You know, you, uh, um, you and, and testimony of how difficult this is, is the flurry of uh, courses um, in presentation giving um, and also in public speaking, because speaking in front of an audience is not easy at all. And if you add to this the you know, the roller coaster of emotions that you go through as a speaker when speaking a foreign language, you will understand what we put our speakers on the podium, uh, what we pick, put them through when, when we ask them to speak in a foreign language. You know, usually the typical reaction of speakers would be that of rushing through the slides, being over with them and go home, but also a deep sense of frustration inadequacy, you know, the feeling of not being good enough. So when we put together the roster of speakers for our uh, conferences, we should always think um, about the effects of imposing a given language on them. And when we select our speakers, the only guiding principle should be their competence, their skills, not their linguistic uh, abilities. And um, I want to share with you uh, a story. Um, a dear friend of mine, uh, who is really a powerhouse of creativity and imagination, was asked to give a TED talk in Italy. I know, I know him very well, and I know he would have been a magnetic uh, speaker. He would have captivated the audience. He's so creative. He would have opened doors to you know uncharted territories of imagination. I know him. Then the organizers told him that um, he was supposed to speak English. He gave it some thought and then he decided to decline the invitation because he thought he would have never been able to really convey the big, the huge universe he had inside of himself. And I think he made the right choice, to be honest. And that's, that was a shame for the, for the audience and for the uh, organizers. 
So, uh, as I said, when we uh, impose a given language, we are basically missing a large po pocket of potential speakers who would be great for our presentation. And if not, uh, we might even cause a lot of embarrassment to, to many of them uh, by forcing them to use a, a language they might not be totally comfortable e in, even if they don't uh, confess it. You know, very often as a professional confidence interpreter, I see delegates coming to me saying, oh, I'm so happy you're here today see, because now I can just focus on what I have to say, not on what, on how I have to say. I will you know, not pay attention to my grammar, to my vocabulary, and I will just focus on the main message of my presentation. And unfortunately, uh, we know of many international organizations that force there are uh, staff to speak English, even when simultaneous interpretation is provided, just because they think it's more professional. Well, it is not more professional to, uh, to do so. Well, I think all of this resonates with the uh, latest or the recent interest in sustainable events, which among other things advocate for uh, uh, diversity and pluralism. But my point is how do you achieve or do we achieve pluralism and uh, uh, diversity if we adopt a one-size-fits-all approach when it comes to languages? We have seen that the language we speak really um, uh, you know, uh, contributes to the, to the way we think, to the way we see the world. We have seen that we are, we think and we act depending on our cultures, a culture and therefore depending on our language. So I think that really doing away with language biodiversity, as I call it, only stifles uh, pluralism and diversity. So, so far we've talked about speakers, but what about attendees? Well, um, staying focused in a conference where everyone else speaks English or speaks another language different from your own mother tongue is really tiring. It really sucks up a lot of energy just to stay focused and decipher the, the language and the message without paying attention to what is being said. Well, um, and there is also another problem. There is this huge stigma in the conference industry that everyone should be able to understand English. You know, you don't want to show your boss or your colleagues that you're not totally proficient, that you are at loss sometimes, that you don't get everything is being said. So you pretend you are getting everything, but as a matter of fact, not everyone does. Um, uh, to, to, I want to share with you this, uh, the results of this study that has been conducted by Professor Albert Presbitero from the Department of Management at the Business School of Melbourne. He wanted to study the effects and the results of uh, global virtual teams, uh, GVT uh, stands for global virtual teams. Um, so the performance of global virtual teams uh, in multinational companies, and he wanted to see whether the language skills of people involved in these GVTs um, had an impact on the performance of those GVTs. And in fact, he uh, proved that language uh, was a barrier for many people. People with poor linguistic skills were less invested in project. They would um, participate less um, uh, you know, and they would perform, of course, poorly. And this, of course, had an impact on the company profitability. Well, it would be, and, and Professor Albert Presbitero talks specifically about cognitive load, and he links the concept of cognitive load to foreign language anxiety, what we talked about before, earlier, you know, uh, xenoglossophobia. So if we were to translate this, to the mice industry, you know, uh, and particularly now when most of our meetings are moving online, are becoming hybrid, are becoming virtually, you know, that's a daunting um, uh, thought because uh, how many people are we actually missing? How many people are, are we not reaching out to because of ling language barriers? Um, or if we do reach to them, 
how do they really feel engaged in the conversation or do they feel isolated and do they feel disconnected? I guess they will easily disconnect, if not physically, at least mentally. And I think that uh, we have uh, a, a, a huge opportunity as professionals in the mice industry at the moment, because of course, as more meetings move virtually, uh, we will be able to reach larger pockets uh, of audience. You know, people that for family ties or uh, economic reasons or for geographical reasons that uh, were not able to travel and attend conferences will now be able to attend those conferences virtually. And they might choose to attend one conference every year physically or maybe a couple of more uh, 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 virtually. So as uh, as uh, professionals in the mice industry, we have this massive opportunity now to reach out to this larger audience and to get them really involved, to get them really on board. Um, and so as a professional conference interpreter, I now have, an uh, I have a suggestion to share with you, which is why don't you invest a little bit of money in high quality interpretation? and help and to fight, uh, help fight linguistic isolation and help your speakers and attendees be more involved. So now I'd like to wrap up my presentation and I'd like to, you know, to go back to some of the points we've gone through uh, during my presentation uh, by saying that, you know, when we force one language onto our speakers, we might cause language anxiety we might limit their performance, and we also run the risk of uh, causing a sense of inadequacy to our speakers. By choosing our speakers based on their language skills, we are limiting the, the range of speakers we can choose from. We will end up choosing the boldest, not necessarily the brightest. We will stifle a pluralism. It, on the contrary, by preserving speakers and attendees language identity, we'll, we'll increase their engagement, we will reduce their sense of alienation, we will enhance our conference impact, and finally, we will maximize profits. Thank you. And I forgot to thank uh, a couple of people who helped me with this presentation, Martin Barrer, Julia Poger, and Sharona Wolkowit. Thank you, guys. Rafaela, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. I thought that was an incredibly unique presentation. Um, it's not a subject I've personally had much exposure to or, or ever thought much about, to be honest. Um, and that, for me, was incredibly enlightening. So thank you so much for um, for sharing that with us. Thank you. Um, <laughs> guys, if you're still watching and you've got any questions that you'd ask to, uh, like to ask Rafaela directly, please do so in the Q&A box um, over the next few few minutes. Um, we did have one request uh, for a list of the books that you mentioned. Okay, sure. Um, is there a way that we can share that with the attendees afterwards? Sure, sure. I can send you all the links. Sure. So we'll, um, event where we'll look at the attendee list and make sure that uh, you guys get a list of those books. Um, thank you, Martin. Mm -hmm. Says congratulations on an excellent presentation. Okay. Um, I, I don't know if I, if I said so, but if you are interested in investigating any further the impact of linguistic isolation in the mice industry, it would be interesting. So please get in touch because, as I said, um, not a lot of research has been done in this area. And I think it, should, it, it would be worth uh, further investigating it. So it would be brilliant if, we, if you know, other people were interested and we could uh, take this as you know, a step I forward. I agree. One thing that was running through my head while you were presenting, actually, um, I, I don't know how true this is. Maybe you can shed some light. It's not a question as such, but um, I heard recently that I think I'm not sure what year it was estimated, but let's say 2050 or 20, 2100, mm -hmm. the only spoken language will be English. Well, I don't know how true this is or whether you have any insight into that, but that would be based on what you just said. That would be such a shame, right? Because absolutely. you don't get to experience the world through other language. Absolutely. I don't know, because of course, I haven't got a crystal ball, but I think there is a tendency to 
um, to make sure that everyone shares this, as I said, globish, this global standardized version of English. And of course, it makes sense. It's easier. You can travel the world and be able to com communicate with everyone. But on a very superficial level, that's fine. But then when you want to get deeper and you want to really, uh, you know, as I said, share your, your I, I keep using this term, the universe, because we do have a universe inside ourselves, you know, our, our cultural background, our knowledge, and, and, you know, all the feelings and ideas are difficult to express in a language and, and, unless you master it. Um, but there are very few but really bilingual people on the planet. Everybody, for everyone, everyone else, English is a second language and it, it never gets to the same level as your mother tongue. So, I mean, it's very hard to bring it to that level and, and therefore losing this uh, linguistic diversity would be a, a shame. And I don't think it's going to happen. No, I don't. I hope probably not. we will have more people speaking global English. That's, sure. that's okay. But it's very different from the English you speak. I, I wonder if you could shed some light, because I, I, I'm uh, admittedly someone who I've, has only ever thought in one language. Um, my thought process and everything I experienced has only ever been in English. There's a time when I was learning some Thai and some Spanish and those words would pop into my head as, as I was about to speak, but I've never experienced communication through any other language than English. I was, I'm curious from your perspective, when you're trying to make a point or you're, you know, having a conversation or when you were presenting just then, does it ever occur to you that actually the point I'm trying to make would be much more beautifully, beautifully Absolutely. spoken in Absolutely. French or in, in Spanish or, no, it would have been more beautifully put in Italian because right. Italian is my mother tongue. I would have loved to, you know, to having uh, to 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 give this presentation in Italian. I would have felt much more comfortable, and I am sure I would have been more interesting. And because uh, when you speak a language which is not your not you know, which is not your mother tongue, you are limited by the um, by the possibilities that you have. And um, yes, of course, when you, when, you, when you learn a new language, you're always told, think in that language. And this is true. This is what we all try to do. I'm speaking English right now. I'm, I'm thinking in English. Otherwise, it would be clumsy. But uh, this doesn't mean that it, it, it is the same as speaking my, my mother tongue. Absolutely not. For sure. Well, I, for one, thought you did a beautiful job presenting <laughs> English. So um, very well done. Uh, Emmanuel, Emmanuel says... Wouldn't the only language in the future be Chinese? Oh. <laughs> I think that remains to be seen. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'm not sure on that one. Um, so, guys, what we'll do is is we'll wrap up the presentation mode for now. Um, mm -hmm. I'll continue the event, um, which has uh, another 10 minutes or so. Um, but we'll go back to the rooms. If you've got somewhere to be, feel free to go and do that. But Rafaela and myself will stick around for the next sort of 10 minutes. Uh, and we can jump on tables and have conversations with you guys. Oh, we've just had one other question uh, come in, actually. Uh, what can be done to fight the stigma felt by non-English speakers mm. when speaking at an event? Really nice question. Yes, that's a very interesting question. Well, the first thing would be to wear headphones when headphones are available. Uh, because I, this is quite common, we say it, even when simultaneous interpretation is provided and all the headphones are there, people tend not to take them because they feel ashamed. So let's start ourselves, I mean, as organizers, let's encourage people to take their headphones because, um, and, 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 you know, encourage people to do so in a nice way, not avoiding any judgmental uh um, a statement or you know just making it as a simple fact here you have uh you know headphones available take it uh it, it it'll be useful for for you to follow it'll be easier less tiring it's 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 a problem and uh and, and you know I, i've read um, many publications also uh, mm, highlighting the fact that there is less scientific uh, literature being published in countries where english is not the official language and this doesn't mean there are not scientists in those countries or good researchers but the linguistic barrier prevent them from writing uh, essays and documents and publications. So we are deprived by imposing this one language attitude. We're really depriving us 
uh, of a wealth of knowledge and of expertise. And um, but uh, I mean, a, a good way of fighting this stigma would be providing more simultaneous interpretation. There is no way uh, out of this. If you don't provide simultaneous imp- interpretation, p- people will feel forced to use English. So it's a, a, a slow pro- process. You know, start by offering a few the typical languages like you know, French or Italian. You know, I, I, and there are many ways of doing this this without impacting the budget too much. For example, you in the um, registration format, you could ask a simple question: Would you be interested in having simultaneous interpretation provided in your language? And maybe people could charge. I mean, could be charged a little bit more, a little. It, bit higher fee if they are going to use simultaneous interpretation. So this will not have a huge impact on the conference budget, but it will foster diversity and engagement because, and I've seen it, we've, we've seen it in conferences ourselves when people can hear the, the translation into their mother tongue, they get more engaged. They feel more likely to take the floor, ask questions, make comments, uh, if not, maybe, you know, they get by, they understand what's going on, they read the slides and they get the gist, the gist of it, but they will never feel comfortable enough to put questions, to make comments, and they might have a, a breakthrough comment, something that really changes the, the view on a given subject. Simply, they will be shy and not uh, put those ideas forward. So I think we are really doing um, a bad job <laughs> and not offering uh, simultaneous interpretation more often. Raffaella, presumably this is something and, and you know, it's similar to the conversation we have around mental health um, in that we have responsibility as organisations and event organisers and thought leaders um, to restructure how we discuss this topic. But equally, we have responsibility as individuals to to learn about this stuff so that we can better prepare ourselves. And when I'm when I say this stuff, I mean one mental health, but also when we're talking about languages, we have a responsibility to take an interest and learn other languages and and, and educate ourselves so that then the world will see it as important to keep communicating in those languages. So there's there's we've got to come at it at two at two angles, right? So I'm well, I guess what I'm getting at is how important is it for us to to emphasize the importance of educa- continuing edu- education of languages at grassroots level so that we continue to have people that speak multiple languages and hence keep the demand high for attendees that are attending these conferences. Well, um, you're touching upon a very important topic because, of course, learning a new language is so important. I'm not saying that people should remain ignorant and just uh, rely on uh, interpreters when they travel or when they attend the conferences. Quite the opposite. I'm a strong believer in the importance of learning languages because when you learn a new language, you really enter a new world. You start seeing things from a different perspective. And how much do we need a broader perspective, particularly now, you know, with all the things that are going on? The more diversified our perspective, the more the, the wider our perspective is, the, the better the world will be one day. So it is definitely super important for everyone and for, for the new generation to learn not one, maybe two, three more languages. The more you have, the, the, the bigger your, uh, you know, your, your mental health will be. But so this is one angle, but the angle I was trying to, uh, to convey is that yes, it's very important, it'll be beautiful and it'll take a long journey to learn a language, but before you get there to, you know, and you master the language well enough to be able to speak in front of a large audience, that's a completely different ball game. And uh, so you might be proficient in, I mean, you might be good in English, but not good enough to present uh, at a conference. This was what I was trying to say. Yeah, and you did so beautifully. And I, oh, I think that's, that's a great point that, you know, before we can educate everyone in new languages and increase their confidence in communicating in those languages, we as, you know, event and conference organisers need to think very carefully about how we accommodate uh, those people, make them feel more comfortable. 
Absolutely. Um, and increase well, their learning experience. Well, thank you very much, Mark, for giving me this opportunity. This is something we rarely talk about uh, at conferences, particularly with uh, professionals of the mice industry. So it was a really valuable opportunity for me. And I want to thank you and Helen a lot and all the pleasure. attendees also. Thank you. And I think that uh, the more we can expose um, young people and people that are trying to learn to speakers like yourself, the more we can encourage them to educate themselves on new languages and and get a broader experience at the conferences that they attend. Yes. So thank you so much thank for that. Thank you very um, much, Mark. As thank I said you. before, we'll 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 go back to table mode now. So if anyone wants to stick around, have a conversation. Okay. Myself and Raphael will be around for approximately the next five minutes. And I'll be at the drinks. <laughs> uh, <you>. Me too. <laughs> Thanks a okay. lot. Thank you. Thank Cheers. you. Bye. Cheers.